Hello there, and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. Now what's that? Let's take a look. Okay, we've landed safely. Now, what was that all about? Um, before I tell you, please answer this question here. Uh, next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days. When is it taking place? Yeah, grab a piece of paper, write down the day, and we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes. So, um, welcome back to the course. I uh, Well, this is going to be sort of a bonus episode. I know I promised I would talk about conceptual blending, but there are still a few things about metaphor that I want to mention. And uh, so you'll remember that in cognitive linguistics there's this idea that the essence of metaphor is understanding one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing, and I gave you a couple of examples for that. For instance, uh, Lenkoff and Johnson's example argument is war. Uh, so you have a source domain, war, and a target domain, arguments, and there are mappings between those two. So the participants of an argument are understood as the fighting parties in a war, and all of the things that you can do in an argument are understood as actions of warfare, like attacking, defending, surrendering, and so on and so forth. Right, I also discussed a couple of empirical studies that show that these connections between target domain and source domain are actually cognitively and psychologically real, so that, for instance, holding a nice and warm cup of coffee can actually make you feel more sympathetic towards others, so that there's a link between the source domain and the target domain in your online reasoning. Um, there are other studies that show that this link also functions in reverse, so that uh, Thinking in terms of a target domain can activate the source domain. So thinking about scenes of inclusion can make you feel a little warm inside, and thinking of exclusion can make you feel a little cold. Right. Um, <clears throat> so this we can uh, sort of represent in a diagram like this by having the mappings between source domain and target domain be bidirectional. So the arrow goes from source to target, but also from target to source. The question for today is whether this bidirectional activation in cognitive terms works with other metaphors as well. So it does seem to work for temperature and interpersonal relations, but what about other metaphors? Is it always the case that the target domain activates the source and the source activates the target. And there's a study that I would like to present to you um, by Lara Boroditsky, who investigated the metaphor time is space. Time is space, that's a very, very common metaphor. We find it in lots and lots of the world's languages. So, for instance, many languages across the world have future markers that are based on verbs of movement. Yeah, English be going to um, uh, French, aller faire quelque chose. So this is very typologically solid. And, um, well, you can imagine why this would be the case. Space is something that we understand rather well. Time is something that is a little bit abstract and complicated. Just to review the mappings from space to time. So um, <clears throat> points or events in time are understood as places, uh, the time that elapses between events is understood as distance between places, uh, processes like aging are understood as movement, and since we're thinking about time in terms of space, we can actually come up with uh, counterfactual concepts like time travel, okay? It's not possible, but in our metaphorical understanding of time, um, well, 
it's possible to go back to a place that I visited before in space. That's totally possible. And so we map it happily into the time domain and think about time travel. So the question that I want to address here is whether the arrow from target domain to source domain is psychologically real. So can we think about time and does that influence our way of thinking about space? That's the question. Now, uh, Boroditsky adopts something that she calls the metaphoric structuring view that is very much in accordance with the ideas of Lakoff and Johnson and she um, expresses it as metaphors provide relational structure to those domains where the structure may not be obvious from world experience. In plain English, stuff that we find difficult to understand and that we cannot experience directly, we understand via metaphor. Yeah? Where it gets complicated, we take some easy to understand source domain and map it into the target domain. So, to give you an example, time is a domain that is abstract, complicated, opaque, and so to understand it, we take the space domain that we understand very well and map all the things from space into time. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Uh, there are two variants of this view. One Boroditsky calls the weak variant and one that is called the strong variant. So, what's the weak variant? Um, the weak variant holds that the source domain is only used initially in order to get a grip on the target domain. And once you've done that, you can happily forget about the source domain and um, you have your conventionalized vocabulary of talking about the target domain. So, say the first people in English to talk about time, they had to use space and came up with all these uh, constructions like be going to and so on and so forth. But we have learned that as children and so we don't have any second thoughts about talking about time with this space vocabulary and we can actually think about time in its own terms. Yeah, So we no longer need to access spatial reasoning when we think about time. And uh, this corresponds very closely to what is sometimes called a dead metaphor. Yeah, you can talk about the leg of a table and you're not fooled into thinking that the table is actually a human person with legs. Right, and by the same token you can say, well, I'm, uh, we're, we're gonna go on a holiday and you're, you're not thinking about literally going somewhere. Okay, um, what about the strong variant? The strong variant would hold that, um, okay, we really cannot understand abstract concepts in terms of their own, uh, but rather we always have to use the source domain when we think about an abstract target domain. So we always have to apply spatial reasoning when we think about time. So um, Boroditsky devised a couple of experiments to tease apart these two views and to come to some sort of conclusion which one of the views is more uh, likely to be true. Okay. Um, to get into this, let me introduce uh, two flavors of the time-space metaphor. There are actually several ways of talking about time in English. Both are spatial, but they are a little different. Uh, one is called the ego-as-moving metaphor. So there are expressions in English such as, he's been going through some tough times lately. And the idea that is conveyed by expressions such as these is that you are an agent, you are moving through time, and some of the times that you're traversing are very tough and other times are good, and so you're, you're making your merry way towards the future, riding into the sunset. Um, a different conception of time is the time as moving metaphor. So you can say, well, I hope that these things will soon pass. Um, in that case, you as an observer, you're stationary and um, time passes uh, and it doesn't pass in, in, in any old way, but rather it appears on the horizon, yeah? so the, the future is ahead of you and it comes forward you and when it reaches you, it's the present and then when it passes you, it is the past. Sounds logical, no? Yeah, of course. Um, However, there are cultures in which the 
uh, past is actually in front of you and that also makes sense because uh, the future you can't see but the past you can see so right uh, I don't want to talk about that um, but it's very interesting so uh, yeah let's talk about the the first experiment that Borodinsky devised so she showed pictures to people which were instantiating either the idea of an ego moving towards a goal or conversely um, an ego being stationary and things in space moving so here this would be an example of the ego moving metaphor um, you see this little mannequin moving towards the dark can and there's a sentence accompanying the picture the dark can is in front of me so people saw this they were in an ego moving frame of mind and then they were asked a question and you've seen this question uh, next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days when is it taking place okay now it's time to get your piece of paper and actually check uh, the day that you've selected um, okay which day did you select you can tell me in the comments whether this worked um, so most people that were primed with the ego moving scenario said well movement the, the meeting is taking place on Friday um, yeah so you were primed also with the ego moving metaphor we all were sitting in the cockpit and the, the plane was touching down and I believe it was Frankfurt so many of you should be team Friday yeah tell me if you're not but uh, do tell me if you are on team Friday the other group saw pictures like this one here uh, so two imaginary objects with no uh, inherent direction or um, front or back and sentences like the light widget is in front of the dark widget these two are in space they are moving and you as an observer are stationary uh, people were asked the same question next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days when is it taking place and lo and behold uh, we have a crossover effect so most people actually say Monday because when you're stationary and you're thinking about time uh, time is moving towards you and then past you and so if um, a time event moves forward it actually moves towards the past towards Monday fantastic no it's, uh, it's amazing uh, results like these so the, the finding is that if you prime people with different ways of thinking about space they will think differently about time so the source domain space activates the target domain and this is very much like the coffee cup uh, experiment where also the source domain in that case warmth activates the target domain in that case sympathy right now um, question does this also work the other way around um, according to the strong version of the metaphoric structuring view thinking about time will necessarily make people think about space okay so the strong view remember uh, we cannot really think about time on its own terms we always have to take recourse to spatial reasoning and that's something that Boroditsky wanted to test um, so she devised a second experiment I'll have to make this large um, so again she showed people pictures of spatial scenarios so here you see a human stationary observer and uh, there are things on a conveyor belt coming towards that person and the sentence to accompany this is the hat box is in front of the Kleenex so we have a spatial prime with a stationary observer we also have temporal primes um, with corresponding sentences so here we have you know a picture of a calendar and then the sentence Thursday comes before Saturday so again this is the time as moving metaphor the observer is stationary and then um, you get the familiar question the temporal target question Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward when is it and um, well the question now is having seen either one of these primes how do you, how do you answer that and the prediction would be okay uh, 
both the spatial prime and the temporal prime here as a stationary observer, so the people seeing this question should be Team Monday. <clears throat> However, there was also a different uh, question, a spatial target question, to test whether temporal primes have an effect on spatial reasoning. And here you see three widgets on a kind of landing strip, and you're being asked which of the widgets are which of the widgets is ahead. Uh, right, so we have a condition from space to time, we have a condition from space to space, we have a condition from time to time, and we have a condition time to space. And the question now is, um, are there similar effects from space to time as from time to space? Right, what do you think? Well, here are the results. Um, you see that three conditions are just about the same, so that, um, okay, the, the y-axis is labeled consistent response, meaning that if you're primed in a certain way, you're more likely to give the Monday or Friday answer and uh, I'll talk about this. Let's first talk about this odd man out here, time to space. What this seems to suggest is here people are at chance level when they're supposed to answer which of the widgets is ahead, they basically guess. You know, sometimes they say okay that one up there is in front or sometimes they say well this one down here is in front. And um, that means that thinking about time in different ways does not influence how you think about space. You're given an expression of time as moving or ego as moving through time that doesn't affect the way that you answer the widget question. Okay, that'll be important. Um, here's another important bar and that is the time to time condition. You see that it is just as, um, well the, the, the rates of consistent responses are just as high, even higher, than for the space-to-time and space-to-space -space conditions. And what that means is that, well, you don't really need spatial thinking to reason successfully about time, and that spells trouble for the strong view of the metaphoric uh, structuring hypothesis. Um, summarizing this, spatial reasoning influences how people understand time. Yeah, that is very much in line with the Lakoffian idea of, of metaphor, we use source domains to understand abstract target domains. Um, but, in come the buts, yeah? Um, spatial schemas are not necessary to reason successfully about time. If we prime people with temporal descriptions, um, that works just as well. So time to time priming works just as well as space to time priming. And that spells trouble for the strong variant of the metaphoric structuring view. <clears throat> A second interesting finding is that temporal reasoning failed to influence people's understanding of space. So there's no connection, apparently, from the target domain to the source domain. Thinking about time does not influence how you think about space. And, uh, well, that contradicts um, the experiment that I talked about earlier in terms of, you know, thinking of inclusion or exclusion and then actually feeling warm or cold as a result. So it seems that we cannot always assume that just because a metaphor exists, uh, there is bidirectional activation between source and target domain. So an important caveat. Right. Okay. Um, I want to come to another metaphor study. And... Um, well, this study goes to uh, the heart of the question, is metaphor really a matter of thought and not a matter of words? So, in the experiments, in all of the experiments that I've shown you, um, the responses that people had to give were in some way linguistic. They had to use words to make their response. And, um, well, if you are a skeptic, you could say, well, <clears throat> If people are using language, if people are forced to use language to give their response, how do you really know that metaphor is a matter of thought? It could be that the language that people are speaking forces them to adopt certain ways of talking. Yeah, do you see that? So, um, 
Well, is there maybe a way of showing that people think metaphorically even when they're not using language? And this is something that uh, Daniel Casasanto and Lara Boroditsky tried to test. Um, again, let me make this large so that I can uh, show you the experiment. So I'd like you to look at the growing line, okay? Look at, just look at the growing line. Um, now there's a line about to appear. There it is. Yeah, uh, you want to see that again? There you are. Okay. Um, now, um, Casasanto and Boroditsky were showing lines to people, and then they were giving them a non-linguistic task as a response. And the task that they gave them was the first task. Um, okay, could you please estimate the length of the line that you just saw? You can do that. You, you saw it on the screen. So um, people were asked to click a starting point with the mouse and then click the length of the line. Uh, th these were put at a different angle as, uh, as to not make it too easy for the participants. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think there's another line that I want to show you. There you go. Another line and a different task. Namely, can you please estimate the time it took for the line to grow? Yeah, it appeared on one uh, end of the screen and then it grew and stopped. How long did that take? Do you have an idea? Well, maybe a second or so. So people were asked to click on the hourglass and then click a short time after to indicate how long they thought it would take the line to grow. Okay, if you want to, yeah, uh, you can stop the video and, and then think about um, the reason for this kind of design. What do growing lines have to do with metaphors? And what do these tasks have to do with conceptual metaphors? Uh, make a few notes, see if you can figure it out, and if you think you have figured it out, restart the video. I'm going to continue now. So. Um, the crucial rub here is that people are looking at the growing lines and are asked to do two different kinds of estimates, a length estimate and a time estimate. And they're being exposed both to the length it took for the line to grow and the visible length of the line. And now an interesting thing, an interesting question is to ask, does the length that people saw influence uh, people's duration estimates and vice versa. Um, does the length that it took a line to grow estimate uh, influence the estimates of length? Okay, and here you see the two results. It seems that length uh, very much influences the duration estimates that people gave. So if people saw a long line, they thought, well, this line must have taken a long time to grow. Yeah. I can understand that. I can understand that. So the longer the line, you see that in the first graph here, uh, <clears throat> the length of the line is shown on the x-axis, and the longer the line, the longer, the greater the time estimates that people gave. And you see that it's a nice correlation there. Perfect result. Um, however, if you look at the second graph, it seems to be the case that time does not influence the length estimates that people gave. So it could be that a line took a long time to grow. If it was short, then people still thought that uh, can't have been that long, right? So there's no nice correlation between uh, target duration and the estimated length in the second graph. Okay, and by now you understand what this means. It means that there's an asymmetry between target and source in the time is space metaphor. <clears throat> Another example is uh, the metaphor similarity is closeness. Similarity is closeness is a metaphor that we see in linguistic examples like the following here. Uh, these two shades of blue are not identical but they are pretty close. They're not close in space, They're, they just look similar. Yeah. 
Um, another example, the opposing candidates couldn't be further apart with regard to this issue. Maybe they are in the same room, you know, sitting right next to each other. In physical terms, they're actually pretty close, just in terms of their opinions. They are far apart. So, similarity is closeness, dissimilarity is uh, distance. Right. Mm, if you are a classic cognitive linguist, you would say, yeah, okay, similarity is closeness. We talk about similarity as closeness. So, it must mean that we also think about similarity in spatial terms. Right. Um, Daniel Casasanto did a series of experiments to investigate that question. And uh, yeah, so here's another task that I have for you. Uh, can you judge, please, how similar on a scale from one to seven are the meanings of the following words? Sympathy and loyalty. Very similar, fairly similar, not so similar, not at all similar. On a scale of one to seven, you know, take your pick. Here's another pair, grief and justice. Similar, not so similar. <laughs> Memory and hope. Similar, yeah, maybe. <clears throat> um, so the <laughs> you notice that um, these words here, grief and justice, sympathy and loyalty, memory and hope, appear in uh, different degrees of closeness or, or distance on the screen. And what uh, Daniel was really interested in was whether this physical distance had an effect on the similarity judgments that people gave. And lo and behold, um, items that were put close to another on the screen received higher similarity ratings than uh, items that were put at medium distance and items that were put far away from each other were judged as highly dissimilar. Now, isn't that funny? So I, I can't help but, you know, puts a smile on my face when I see these results. Okay, um, then, uh, you know, Psychologists, they always do several variants of uh, similar experiments to see whether the effect is really robust. So um, here's a second variant of the example, of the experiment. How similar are these faces? Um, yeah, these two girls, quite similar, I'd say. Mm, not so similar. The, the eyes are different, I think. And also there, the, the, the eyebrows are different. Okay, now what do you think happened? Um, similar judgments when the, the pictures are close together? Or, you know, what do you think? Here's the result. It's the exact opposite of the experiment with the words. Okay, so pictures that were presented in close proximity were judged as highly dissimilar, and pictures that were presented far apart were judged as very similar. Now that is completely unexpected from a conceptual metaphor point of view. How can you explain that? If you want to, you can again pause the video and, and think if you can come up with an explanation of why nouns pattern just as the inverse of pictures. I'll continue now. So the explanation that um, Dan Casasanto offers is that there is a distinction between conceptualization, which happens with the words, and perception, which happens with the faces. So conceptualized entities like grief and hope and memory are subject to metaphorical thinking. If we want to know what uh, grief is, we conjure up some metaphor in our mind. Um, Perceived entities, on the other hand, like faces and their facial, facial traits, uh, they are judged on their own terms. So there's no metaphor involved, um, no influence whatsoever from conceptual metaphor. So it would be, you can, you can sort of save the conceptual metaphor theory by saying, look, we get the effect with words where we uh, expect the effect of similarity is closeness, but we do not expect the effect when the, task, when the task that you give people is about perception, not conceptualization. So, um, in a way, 
that's a preliminary answer. But notice that conceptual metaphor does not predict the negative effect that you observe in the perceptual task. So the uh, conceptual metaphor theory has no explanation for the third bar being as high as it is. Sorry, I have to take that. Okay, sorry, I'm back. But I was basically done here, I think. Um, right, so... <clears throat> Coming back to this issue, is conceptual metaphor a matter of thought and not words? Um, the growing lines seem to suggest that yes, um, time and space is a matter of thought that you activate not only when you use language, but also when you're engaging in non-linguistic uh, tasks. Um, but there's a cautionary tale here. Uh, so just because a metaphor is there in language, think of similarity as closeness, that does not mean that people use it to think about the world. So similarity as closeness would predict that people judge faces as more similar when they're presented in close proximity. But apparently they don't do that, they do the opposite. And that is because perception intervenes. So conceptual metaphor theory always kicks in when there's conceptualization going on, but when you're engaged in a perceptive task, then it seems that it does not always do that. So what uh, Daniel Casasanto then concludes on is the, the, um, the idea that linguistic examples, offline linguistic examples, are a very good source for hypothesis formation about cognition, but crucially, they do not in themselves constitute evidence for patterns of thought. And that, I think, is a very uh, good idea to maintain. Right, uh, that was it for today. I'll see you next time, and then hopefully with conceptual integration.